Dear Father, we come to you as a church, as a body of believers. Father, we come with all kinds of things upon our minds. Lord, whatever they are, we get to bring them to you. We offer them to you. We set them aside from ourselves. We bring them to you. We say, Father, here it is. Forgive me. Encourage me. Restore me. Love me. Show me that, Lord. Father, direct us and lead us. Father, if there's any questions that we have this morning, may we offer them to you. You can handle it. Father, you are just an amazing God. One that cannot be defined by our language completely. One that's indescribable, as your word says. Father, we just pray that you will touch each one of us, whatever things that are on our minds now and things that we are going through or heading toward or we're contemplating or we're trying to understand or, or, or come to grips with, Father, we pray for your guidance and your direction. Lord, be with our country. Father, we pray for those who are in, in, in leadership, in government. Father, we lift them before you as your word calls us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, our ushers will come forward. And thank you, by the way, for your support of this church. As we continue in our series in Hebrews, this is, this is message six, part six of this series, and we have made it to verse four. Isn't that good? We are going to make some, gr we're going to make some ground up this morning. Um, this has just been a fun study in God's Word. And what I want to tell you at the onset of, of this message is, one of the things that I have always vowed as a pastor is to be is is to be honest, is to be genuine and real, not put on a show. And uh, you know, a lot of this series is really birthed out of not just my study of God's word, but really it's God working with me. And so, um, you'll see some of that as this comes, as this message moves on. But what I want to do is establish before we read one of that I think is one of the most difficult texts dealing with context 
of the Bible. Here you have a culture in which this letter was written around 60 AD, 60, 62 to 63 AD, that is. And you have a culture in which it's written to. The Hebrew people, like I said, you remember the context of this. Over here, the Hebrew of Hebrews, those who studied the Torah, their history there is in, is, is in Israel. Then you have the Hellenistic Jews, those who have been scattered abroad, those who have, um, they speak the Greek language. They have a different culture necessarily than the Hebrew people, but they're, they're Jews, they're Hellenistic Jews. And we're going to find out that they were the ones that translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, and we call that the Septuagint. And then you have, over here, you have those who have been Judaized, those who are Gentiles, but gravitated towards Judaism, and now you've received Christ into your life. You guys are radical. And then you have the Gentiles over here who just heard the message of Jesus Christ and responded to him by faith. Now, understand the history, understand the context, that at this time in world history, in this neighborhood, this culture, if you were to be born, your life expectancy is the average age of 20 to 30 years of age. And if you live to be past the age of 10, you could expect your average lifespan to be 47.5. You're looking at a culture in which this writer of Hebrews is writing to a people that are being persecuted, people that have lost their families, especially right here, lost their families, Division in the home. You're looking at people who have been persecuted by Rome as well. For Rome looks at, at you guys, these, these Gentiles, and think you're nuts. Why would you believe in this Jesus who's been crucified, tortured, and you worship him as God? You guys are nuts. In fact, Rome looked at the pagan culture that, that accepted Jesus Christ in their life, it, 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 the Gentile background, they looked at you guys as atheists. That's what is written in world history, as atheists. Because you didn't worship Rome. You didn't worship the pantheistic, pantheistic gods. You didn't worship all the gods that Rome had. And so you guys were really kind of strange. You can understand, you know, the... The Hebrew people, it's like, you know, they're just kind of a culture and a group and an ethnic group, basically, that Rome looked at and kind of accepted your one God. But you Gentiles, it's like you're messing up Rome. And you won't even bow your knee and worship Caesar as Lord. Our crops are failing. And things are happening. And good things Bad things are happening, and you're getting blamed for it, and we are going to persecute you. It wouldn't be uncommon for the church to assemble in at least one family, if not every Sunday, at least once a month, would have lost a child to death. Or a family member persecuted or a family torn in two. Could you imagine what their worship service was like? Wow. Now can we read? In your struggle against sin, I love the way the NIV translates this right here. They, they talk about it's not just, a, not just you're struggling with sin, it's your struggle against it. It's your struggle against the things that are not of God. It's, not, it's the things that God doesn't like, that they're missing the mark, whatever that might be. In your struggle against sinful man or against the sinful nature of this world, have you not resisted to the point of shedding your own blood yet? Whoa. 
Hey, let's move on here. Look at this. In verse 5, and have you forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? He's talking about now a word of encouragement. Let's see what that word of encouragement says to this hurting people. And by the way, he quotes the Septuagint right here. It's an exact quote. Not the Hebrew Old Testament, the Septuagint. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as son. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? By the way, that's like that's a quote from the Old Testament. That is one of the Ten Commandments. That if you submit to your fathers, you will have a long life, correct? And now he's saying if you submit to the Father, you will live. That's rich. Look at verse 10. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Let's back up a little bit. You look at this text. We are, I've already told you the context. And then when you read these verses, and you know that the pain and the hurt and the struggle and the situations that the church would be going through, that people personally would be going through, and you read this, you want to almost take a deep breath as an American citizen and go, whew, I wonder what this writer would have for us to say about us. Interesting. I love the translation, our struggle against sin. And the NIV uses the word discipline dealing with chastisement. And that didn't translate very well, and I love the reason for their using the word discipline. It means correction. It means basically looking at the nature of things and learning from that. You see, chastisement a, 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 a punitive measure of, of correction is basically this. You do what's wrong, and you're going to get punished for that, and that's all the purpose of it is for, is to punish them. But that's not what Jesus came for. He came not to condemn. He came to save. He came to give us life and to give it abundantly. And so this Context is dealing with the hardships and the struggles that we go through. And may I say this, that there are hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes. There's all kinds of things that we go through naturally, the nature of things that are painful and there are hardships on all of us. And in particular, people that are going directly through some of that, even right now. And we're going to look at this. Because I know that it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter if, if what I'm going through right now is, is light and momentary or, or whether I'm going through something right now that is difficult and painful or whether I'm heading for something that I don't even see, but God does. We need to know how to handle these things. What I'm going to do is I want to walk through this text with nine areas of lessons that God taught Jesus personally. They're from the text, and I want us to I, I want us to understand that just because I learned those lessons didn't mean I did them very well. Okay, so if if I had 
God as my teacher, which he is, and that's what the word discipline means, that these are things that he's going to use to teach us lessons. But I want you to know if God was my teacher and he was going to grade me on it, I would have failed. But because of Jesus and his grace, his grace makes all the difference in the world. First point is, no discipline is pleasant. Anybody really love discipline? Anybody just love to go through difficult times? You know, it's like, you know when the apostles were persecuted because, in the book of Acts, when they were persecuted because of their testimony to Jesus, that they were excited about it because they felt worthy to be persecuted? It's like, I'm not there yet. It's a beautiful picture. Discipline is painful. It's not pleasant. Jesus, in the previous three verses, said that he endured the cross, scorning, despising its shame. Kind of puts me in a good place. Jesus didn't like it. It's painful. It's unpleasant. I think it's okay to admit that. Are you, are you with me? It's okay to admit that. It's okay to admit when, when something happens, whether it's by nature or by my own hand, my own doing, it hurts. I remember talking to someone dealing with a person that is hurt. And, and, and I said, you know what? If a person is hurt, it doesn't matter why they're hurting. It doesn't matter if you fall from a window accidentally. It doesn't, if you're reaching for a cat in the tree and you fall and you break your leg or you're a little kid goofing around in the tree and you fall out of the tree. It doesn't matter. It's still broken. It still hurts. Discipline is painful. Number two is I had to recognize God's allowance. This is huge. I'm going to take a little bit of time to walk through this. God, there's God's prescriptive will, and there's God's permissive will. God's prescriptive will is kind of like this. It's kind of like, you know, I want this to happen. I'm going to cause this to happen. I'm going to make sure this happens because God's God. His prescriptive will. There's also God's permissive will, God's allowance. God will allow things to happen in our life. He allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. There's things that God, there's tsunamis, there's hurricanes, there's earthquakes, there's people that are born with diseases. There's horrible things that can happen to humanity. That God will allow. That God doesn't necessarily say, I want that prescriptively to happen, but because of the environment, because of the situation, I'm going to allow that to happen. I love how people want to blame God in natural disasters. I guess they can in his allowance. But what people don't realize, and what C.S. Lewis said, is he brought out the fact that even earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, all of these things, well, earthquakes in particular, it's plate tectonics. Without plate tectonics, we wouldn't even have life on this planet. C.S. Lewis said that, that we are good at wanting the two-by-four to be solid and strong when it's holding up our deck or it's holding up our house. But if we get hit with it, we want it to go with it. Isn't that interesting? In other words, the beauty of God's allowance is this, is that all hardship, all struggles that we go through, this is the beauty of the cross, is all of the wrongdoing, all of the pain, all of the struggle, every single thing flowed through the cross, and Jesus reached out his arms and died because of sin. And, 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 and this world is groaning and longing for the day of redemption. 
I love it that even a leading scientist most recently said that our cosmos is broken. Through Jesus Christ, what flows to him and to the cross allows those things that happen that are despicable, allows grace to flow back to us, his people. That's the beauty of the cross. It takes the things of this world that are seemingly meaningless, and God can use those very things as teachers, as a discipline, to help us know who we are better and work things out in a redemptive way. I did not do justice to that point, but I must move on. Number three, responding the right way was the hardest thing I ever did. When it comes to dealing with circumstances and situations and struggling with sin and struggling against it, it was what God showed me he wanted me to do, at least in the struggles of my life, is the most difficult thing I, I, I could do. The hardest thing was to do what he wanted me to do. It was the most difficult. Like, like God, what I'm going through right now, I am, I am... I am hating life. In fact, God, I'm right. I'm hating you. You okay? You're probably saying, whoa. Have you ever been through something in your life? The most difficult thing for me to do was the right thing. It wasn't the easiest. We, we are good at taking the path of least resistance in our spiritual walk. When in reality, what God does is he says, I'm using a teachable moment in your life, whatever it may be, whatever circumstance, whether it is by my own fault, by somebody else's fault, by natural disaster, by circumstances of this life, whatever it is, God is wanting me at this moment to make the most difficult decision is to obey him. It was the most hardest thing. And I'm not saying I did. I'm saying I came through difficult thing I ever did. Number four. The sooner I responded the right way, the better. And that was the truth. I didn't think so at the time, but the, but when I finally responded the right way, I guess they, uh, it's uh, Jason's back there. <laughs> He's going to get that. Um, let, let's move. Let's go to number five. God loves me. That's what I learned. I learned that God loves me. And I, I tell you my message is God loves me a lot. Because he disciplines those whom he loves. It's like, that's, that's, a, that's what the writer says, you know. It's like, boy, just, have you ever got there, you know, in your life where you say, boy, just, God, you just love me a lot. you got so much for me to learn. I'm really done learning now. Would you just give me a break, you know. It's, it's like, but I did. I learned the fact that God loves me. Number six. Two distractions to be in discipline. I'm not sure if they're in order or not, but I'll do this. There's two distractions. One of them is motives and methods. You see, whatever it's a, if, if it's circumstances, after disaster, somebody's out to get you, somebody is, it, it doesn't like you, hates you, and is going to try to, <laughs> you want you buried, or, or whatever it may be in this life. What happens is that there are distractions and uh, motives. It's like, God, why are you doing this? God, why are you doing this? Or what about the motives of somebody else? Why? That person has it in for me. And as long as we focus, or in my life, as long as I focused on the motive of somebody else, 
even the motive of God. If, as long as we focus in on that, or, or the misunderstanding of God's motive is really what it is, because his motive is clear, is he wants to keep them in their good things. But when the motives of somebody else are not good, and that takes our eyes off the prize, is when we look at somebody else instead of ourselves. You see, one of the things I realize in my life is when, is, is when things weren't working out well and I was miserable and in a lot of pain. Is I had to look at myself in the mirror and I had to fix it. I didn't like it. You see, the distraction is, is to take our eyes off of what God wants to teach. It was a teaching thing. It's a thing that he, well, did he want this to happen to me? Did he want to, to destroy my family? No. But can he take a situation and use it to teach me something? Oh, you betcha. I'll admit, I'll confess to you. I, there, were t- there were mornings I got up and I would look in the mirror. And I literally despised the person I was. And God said, I want to change you. So things were just distractions. The other things were methods. God, I don't like your method. Really? Really? If you really wanted my attention, why couldn't you have picked a better way? Just ask me. Right? I could have chosen a lot of other, you know, but again, God's allowance. He's not going to change other people's wills. The freedom of the will for people even to do wrong. The next thing is, I'm going to follow what they're doing. And it does happen. Will it happen? Will it happen? There we go, yes. Submitting to God is a trust issue. Submitting to God is a trust issue. You know, I... I'm going to tell you a story, and I got permission to use this. David and Julie, this was two or three years ago when the Newtown shooting happened, when the gunman killed the children in grade school. Emily was a little girl that Julie, when she was in training to be a PA, she babysat and took care of this little girl named Emily. And then she moved to Newtown. The girl had grown up in grade school and got killed in the shooting. That really hit a lot of people's world who knew of the situation and were directly involved in it. One of the things that I said to Julie in her phone call when we first met each other, when I first got to talk to her, I said, you know, this is evil. This is painful. This is sickening. This is suffering. Emily, again, the redemption flow of the cross, what goes to the cross and what flows to us. The fact that Emily is with Jesus. We don't know all the particulars, but Emily's with Jesus. And what we do with that situation is a teachable moment for all of us of how we're going to respond. How will we respond? And I said, what value and meaning will you give this little girl's life? Give your life.
good. Get the beauty of the cross. Is we have to trust God that no matter what we are going through, no matter what circumstances that we are in, are we going to trust God in it? We don't know. You see, there's the bits of my life that God can take even the most difficult circumstances, the, the bits and the pieces of my life. He's not, he's not rebuking Dane. It says in the text. He's not rebuking, he's rebuking the bits of Dane that are not like him. He's rebuking those things in my life that he wants to bring me into obedience with. Does that make sense? What are the bits of your life that God stands opposed to? And those are the things that he wants to change. We have to trust him with it. The next one, number eight, is God is not against me. I learned that. God is not against me. Oftentimes we feel persecuted. We feel like the world is against us, and it's not. It's God is with us. He's for us. He's not against us. I I love that it's an issue of trust. It's an issue that he's not against us. I love the disciples. The disciples, I mean, it's Jesus is preaching in his ministry. He's got these crowds following him, and all of a sudden, I love in John, where he begins to teach a rather difficult. He starts to teach something a rather harsh and difficult, which, by the way, if you look at Jesus' life, the closer you get to the cross, the thinner the crowd gets. Notice that? Yeah. Enter again. Jesus says to a group of, of, of quite a few followers, thousands, He says to them that you must consume me. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're going, this is a tough teaching. Who can accept it? They all left. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, well, what are you going to do? You know what they start to say? Where will we go? Where will we go? We've given you everything in our life. We are following you. Where are we going to go? You lost, you know, we were thinking that you're going to be pretty hot here, you know, bringing all these people beside you. And, yes, we're going to march against Rome, and the kingdom of God is going to come. Well, if you just, that doesn't look very good right now. Where else are we going to go? Sometimes God gets us into positions like that. He says, Where are you going to go? Jesus, you're with us. You're not against, he's not against us. He's for us. And the last thing is sharing in God's holiness and his peace. God's holiness and his peace. You know, (laughs) I think... Going through difficult times and struggles and stuff like that, there's there's times where what God does is he gives us a little bit of heaven. He gives us a little glimpse of heaven. Because it would, it, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who have been trained by it. through any difficult times, been through any struggle, it will produce a righteousness. If you allow God to use those times to teach you, no matter how difficult, he will take you and transform you and change you and produce holiness in your life, will produce righteousness in your life, will produce peace. You see that? Peace. We tend to leave that out. Peace. You know what God did? In all of the circumstances, what he did is he changed me. Not necessarily the circumstance. God wanted me to pray for the person who helped inflict pain on my life. He wanted me to pray for them. 
Not only that, but how bizarre could he possibly get? He wanted me to pray blessings upon them. Wait a minute. But you know what? I did it. I prayed that God would bless them. And you know what Dane wanted to pray? Okay, you get it. But what the blessing did, the person that receives the blessing from God, hang on to this, that's grace coming from God to them. They have a choice to make. They either receive that blessing or they reject it. And if they receive it, we all praise God. Glory to Jesus. Things are better. But if they reject it, that doesn't say bless them. They need to hear it. And God showed me that I was no better than the person who was hurting me. I was no better than them. That's humbling. Those were the lessons that I learned. I prayed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Today is the time to repent. It's the time to say, Lord, take these little bits of my life that get exposed in difficult times and in hardship. Lord, all of these little bits, as ugly as they are, I give them to you. Forgive me. I'm sorry. For Lord, I, what I did flowed through the cross. But Jesus, what you give me is the grace. Help me not to look at others or situations and get distracted off how you are bringing me into that completeness in you, Lord. Thank you for your loving me. Your forgiving me. And giving me hope and a future that will produce a, a rightness in my life a peace in my life because I did the hardest thing in the world by saying yes to you, Jesus, submitting, submitting to you and protecting you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you.